One of the most difficult things with photo editing is just knowing when to say when. And I think we can all agree that at some point throughout our photographic journey, we've had somebody tell us, person, if you're gonna start editing your photos, you need to add contrast, because contrast is king. It's really gonna give your photos that punch and that pop to catch the viewer's attention. But don't add too much contrast, because you'll ruin your photo. Or make sure you're adding saturation to your images to really give your colors that pop to catch the viewer's attention. But don't add too much saturation, because you'll ruin your photos, but no one ever tells you when you're about to ruin your photos and how do you know when to say when? And that's the topic of this week's video is how to identify when you're about to commit one of the five major signs of an over-edited photo. Now, the first one being has to do with highlights and shadows and specifically unrealistic highlights and shadow adjustments. And as you can see in this image right here, uh, I didn't blow out the sky, but I definitely blew out the sun. And if we turn on the clipping indicator, J, you can see that the sun is completely blown out right here. And a quick tip is if you go up here to profile and you change this from Adobe standard to Adobe neutral, watch what happens to the clipped area of the sun. Immediately is reduced. And Adobe neutral is just a, a flatter profile, gives you a little bit more latitude or wiggle room from a dynamic range perspective to, uh, to resolve clip shadows or clipped highlights. And I like to do that, change that profile to Adobe Neutral whenever I have clipped highlights that I'm trying to recover. And as you can see in this scene, there, there isn't a great deal of clipped highlights, but I definitely blew out the sun. And what I would typically do in the past is I would bring the highlights way down here and you're left with this ring around the sun. And this is a very common thing. You see a lot of photos where the highlights are just brought down way too far. And this is a telltale sign is whenever you get that, that big kind of dark muddy orange ring around the white sun. And that's a telltale sign that the highlights have been brought down way too far. And I'm embarrassed to say this, and it took me a long time to realize this, but the sun is bright and it's okay if the sun is bright and i was always just trying to reduce the so much of the highlights of the exposure around the sun to try and resolve blown out highlights but it's okay if you leave it a little bit bright because at the end of the day the sun is bright took me a while to figure that out but so for this specific image instead of cranking down the highlights all the way i just want to bring it down just a touch until you start to see that ring around the sun start to develop then you want to pull it back and as you can see, this definitely looks much more realistic than trying to bring it all the way down to something like that. So watch for that ring around the sun. That's a number one sign that you're bringing your highlights down way too far. Now on the opposite side of that is the shadows. Now shadows are very important in an image. One, it creates story, it adds drama, and it also creates kind of uh, Three, dimensi three dimensionality, is that the word? Three dimension, structure, that's what I'm looking for. It creates structure to an image. So you wanna make sure that you have shadows within your photo. So for this image here, if we zoom into the, the rocks here in the foreground, you'll notice that there's, there's good structure here and a lot of the structure is created because of the shadows. And if we crank the shadows all the way up, the image becomes very flat and has that kind of HDR look associated to it and all of the stones have all of a sudden lost the three dimension. So really pay attention to how you're affecting the shadows really from a structure perspective. If you get to a point to where you're removing all the shadows from your photo and it starts to look flat, you've gone way too far on your shadow adjustment. You need to bring it back a little bit. So really pay attention to that. Now, the second one has to do with contrast and contrast is, is definitely king. It's very important. It can really make or break a photograph. Now having too little contrast is not quite as detrimental to an image as having too much contrast, but being able to identify when you have applied too much is, is very critical and it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But what I found most beneficial is to really pay attention to my shadows. So once again, we'll uh, zoom into these rocks here and you'll notice that we'll zoom a little farther. You can see a lot of detail in the shadow areas of these rocks. And if I bring up the contrast to a point to where all of that detail in the shadows is actually lost, and you might hear people talk about it as the, the shadows are getting uh, blocked up, and if it all becomes black and muddy, that's a sign that you've gone too far with, this, with the contrast slider. So you want to bring that back some. So really pay attention to the shadow areas of your image. If you lose all the detail in your shadows, you've definitely gone too far and you wanna bring that back. 
Now, the third thing, and this is a very important one to me, because I really struggled with this a lot when I got into photography, and it has to do with over sharpening my photos. I was obsessed with uh, image sharpness. Even if the image was blurry, like, like um, wind blew my tripod and it was a little fuzzy, I would still try and sharpen that image back to a sharp image. But in reality, if the image has any kind of camera shake or blur to it, there's no amount of sharpening in the world that's gonna correct for that blur. Even if I had an image that was sharp, you know, there was no camera shake, I would just end up applying just too much sharpness to that or too much clarity to, uh, to a point to where the image almost had that kind of gritty, rough, over-texturized quality to it, which just looks awful. And I'll show you what I mean here. So a great way to tell if you are adding too much sharpness to an image, and this is a good example here because this lighthouse is in front of a bright sky and the lighthouse has black and white in it. And what Lightroom is doing when uh, you're using sharpness or clarity is Lightroom is trying to identify an edge. And the way that Lightroom identifies an edge is by determining where light pixels meet dark pixels. And wherever that happens to be, Lightroom is gonna say, okay, that's an edge. So if we zoom into this lighthouse right here, we're gonna zoom in pretty far, even farther than that. And you and take the, uh, the clarity slider here and we're gonna really kind of crank it up. And then we're gonna come down here to the, uh, the detail panel and we'll take the sharpening and we're really gonna crank that up as well. And you can see right here, you see this halo? You can see the halo here, but the halo's not here, but it, then it picks up here again. And that's because this is where the black is meeting the lighter part of the sky, but white against the lighter part of the sky. Lightroom is having a difficult time determining if that's an edge or not. So that's why you don't see that halo here. And that's just kind of, a, I found that interesting information and it's always better to understand exactly how Lightroom is doing it in order to help you identify when you've gone too far. So whenever you see that halo, that is the number one sign that you've gone way too far. So if we just do one at a time, so you can see the sharpening here, you really have to zoom in, but you can see the halo there. If we turn it on or off, that's off and that is on. It'll take a second. And it almost looks like the edge is just glowing a little bit. Now, when you uh, do that with the clarity, the clarity slider actually shows a, uh, the glow even more. So there's the glow with the clarity slider. And if we just turn that back off or to zero, you can really see the difference there. So really pay attention to the, and that's, and that's what the overall image would look like with all the clarity. So really pay attention just to the, uh, the, the edges of your photo and really look for that glowing halo because if you see that, you need to just bring it back just a little bit. And it's okay to have a, 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 a tiny bit of that of the, of the halo, but whenever you really start, when it starts to become very obvious, that's when you really wanna to start to dial it back to um, in order to get away from that over sharpened look. Now, the next example, I think this is number four, has to do with, with vignetting. And this is something that a lot of beginners do when they start post-processing their images is they just put a, a, just a completely unrealistic vignette. A vignette is supposed to almost be invisible, but it's there. That's how subtle it's supposed to be. And much like anything in post-processing, it's meant to enhance your photo, but not distract. And a lot of times, if you have an unrealistic vignette on your image, it becomes a distraction. And I'll show you what I mean. And I actually don't even vignette my photos with the in the effects panel in Lightroom. I'll show you how I do it in a minute, which I think is much better. But if you bring this vignette all the way down, say like in the 60s, it just looks so obvious here that you have it on there and it's a distraction. It distracts you from the, uh, the overall purpose of this image. So using that, I mean, and if you are gonna use this, just use it very subtly, but I have a, I think I have a much better way of doing or applying a vignette and kind of using a vignette with purpose because at the end of the day, the purpose of, the, of a vignette is to direct the viewer's eye towards the center of your photograph. But we're conditioned with like the rule of thirds and different types of compositional uh, best practices and rules to never put our subject smack dab in the center of our image. So why would we have a vignette that's always pointed directly to the center of the image? So I always create a custom vignette for every one of my photographs. It's super simple to do. You just come up here to the radial tool and we're just gonna draw a circle say like that. And uh, I'm going to hit shortcut key O just to show the uh, the mask. And then I'm going to hit this check mark here, invert. 
and that's going to flip the uh, the vignette around. So now everything in the center here is not going to receive the vignette. And then we will change the feather to maybe like around there. And then we're just going to bring this up to around this area here because for this photo, the uh, the main focus is the Golden Gate Bridge, which is clearly not in the dead center of the image. So I really want to draw the viewer's eye to the Golden Gate Bridge. So utilizing this type of vignette is definitely going to um, aid in the uh, the viewer you know, uh, the viewer's eye automatically gravitating directly to that. So we'll just bring this right up here. Maybe make a couple adjust adjustments to the uh, actual radius of this. Just bring it up there. Maybe bring and then now we're actually going to adjust the actual amount of the vignette. I'll exaggerate a little bit just so you can see it at home. And then we will turn this off and uh, on, off, on. So that's just an easy way to make kind of a more purposeful vignette for your photograph is just to, to, to make the vignette around your main subject. It's a real simple way to do it. Really creates a lot of drama. But ultimately, just paying attention to how much vignette you're putting in your image. If it becomes obvious and a distraction to your photograph, you've gone way too far with your vignette. So pay attention to that. And then the fifth one, and this is by far the hardest, has to do with saturation. Now, I've done a ton of research over the years trying to identify a way to determine when you've gone overboard with saturation. And there really isn't one. This is the only thing I've come up with. If you zoom all the way into a photo, and if you look right through here, you can see this detail right through here, right? Now pay attention to this when I really crank up the saturation. See that? Completely, it, it just, you start to lose the detail right through there. But the thing is, is the only way to, to, to lose detail from saturation is to bring your saturation slider up to 100. And at the end of the day, who's really doing that? So there really is not a good way to uh, to identify when you've gone overboard with saturation. I've, I've heard some people say, bring in the, the saturation slider up to about 30 and then start to work backwards. And yeah, that, that could definitely work. But I mean, I, I see very few photographs that are saturated well above 30, definitely. So, and usually, I usually use negative saturation and positive vibrancy. I use that kind of combination to um, increase the uh, the overall saturation of the colors in my images if I'm not going into the HSL panel and adjusting the individual color channels. But probably the best advice I can give on saturation is to use the shortcut key F, and that's going to put you in the full screen mode. Take a look at your photo like that, and then walk away. Just get away from it for... 10 minutes, 30 minutes a day, as much time as you can afford to be away from it, and then come back and look at your saturation and see if it still looks normal. And keep natural in your mind. The way it looked, when, the, the way the scene looked when you captured the image, that's ultimately what you want to mimic. And if your colors are just completely unnatural and look like, I don't know, Wizard of Oz or something like that, you've definitely gone too far. So that shortcut key F and just walking away is definitely something that's helped me. And then of course, just taking the saturation from whatever level you think is good, 20, and then dropping it to zero and just kind of bouncing it back and forth to see how much of a change. If the change is huge, maybe you went too far. But those are the, uh, the five ways that have helped me to identify when I'm going overboard on an edit and I hope they will help you at home. And I hope you didn't know all those and hope you're able to pick up something new possibly from that information. And for those of you uh, watching, if you happen to know of a way to identify when you're oversaturating an image that I didn't mention, please leave it in the comments below. I would love to find out. And if you have any questions, as always, leave those in the comments below too. And I guarantee I will get back in touch with you. And I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next week. Bye.